All right, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for, it says October, 2023, but it's actually November 1st. <laughs> um, it was October yesterday. So um, this is a community call that is brought to you by the ORCID US community and ORCID CA, which stands for Canada, um, on the topic of fair care and persistent identifiers. And if you don't know what any of those are, don't worry, because that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so my name is Sheila Rabin. I am at Lyricis, which is the administrative home for the ORCID U.S. community, um, which is a consortium of nonprofit organizations in the U.S. that are ORCID members. Um, my colleague, Paolo Guhilde, is our strategist for the ORCID U.S. community. He's also on the call. And then um, from the... Canadian side, we have John Aspler. John, I don't know if you want to uh, introduce yourself so you can do the the French as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Sheila. So I'm John Aspler. I am the manager of the Canadian PID community, the Canadian PID community at CRKN. Uh, je suis le gest gestionnaire de la communauté canadienne des identifiants pérennes et je vous encourage, si vous voulez, de poser vos questions en français. Je vais traduire uh, au besoin. So uh, if you would like to ask your questions in French, I uh, certainly encourage that and I'm happy to translate as needed. Wonderful. Thanks, John. Um, so the three of us uh, work together to coordinate this call and I'm very pleased to also introduce two very special guest speakers that are joining us today. We have Mike Nason. Mike is the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian at the University of New Brunswick, and he's going to be talking about the FAIR principles. Um, and then we also have Dr. Riley Tidingfong. Uh, Riley is the Loose Foundation Postdoctoral Researcher at the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona. Um, so Riley will be talking to us about the care principles. So thank you, Mike and Riley, for being our guest speakers on this call today. So um, like I said, we're going to hear a presentation from Mike about the FAIR principles. We'll hear from Riley about the care principles. They're going to share some of their initial insights. And then we're going to have time to open it up for discussion and questions. So that's kind of a, a big focus and a big reason why we're having this call today is to bring everyone together who's interested in this topic to discuss and think together about um, not only the different principles, but specifically because we are representing the ORCID communities um, in the U.S. and Canada, thinking about how ORCID and other persistent identifiers kind of fit in. What are some things that we should be thinking about um, as we're, we're doing this work? Uh, so with no further ado, um, I'm going to hand it over to John really uh, quick for our land acknowledgement, and then we'll get into the um, the presentations. Thanks, Sheila. So this is a land acknowledgement that we use at CRKN, but I'd invite anyone uh, who would like to share acknowledgements from the territories that they're in to feel free to share them in the chat. So we respectfully acknowledge that the CRKN office is located on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Uh, but CRKN staff live and work across the entire country known as Canada on the ancestral and traditional territories of many different indigenous peoples whose presence extends back to time immemorial. We also acknowledge the many guests of this webinar uh, calling from many different territories. And Thank with you, that, John. I think we're handing it over to Mike. That's right. I'm going to stop sharing and Mike, you can take it away. Great. Are we visible? We're visible, I assume. Looks good. Okay, cool. Uh, I am going to move at a pace that is uh, frankly irresponsible. Uh, for those of you who have seen me give talks before, you were probably not not used to this. Um, so I'm going to talk about fair principles and persistent identifiers, and I'm going to cover a lot of ground really quickly. Uh, I have labeled these as two great tastes that so taste great together. Um, so uh, fair and PIDs, 
uh, kind of almost one in the same, and we'll address this um, in, a, in a more specific way moving forward. So quick introduction, I'm the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian at what to most of you would be a pretty small school in Atlanta, Canada, the University of New Brunswick. I also work for PKP, the Public Knowledge Project, as a member of their Publishing Services team, where I'm the cross and Metadata Liaison. I stand at a pretty interesting intersection between publishing, authoring, and then discovery in my role as a Skullcoms librarian. Uh, that means I more or less never shut up about open scholarly infrastructure. Like a lot of people who don't shut up, I look like this. Um, I'm a white cis settler from the unceded, aka stolen territory of the Mi'kmaq Wallistikway peoples, just a short hop from the Wallistook River. Settlers to the region named this river the St. John, a testament to both their repression and lack of creativity. A lot of people, even my, even to my perpetual dismay, many Canadians don't know where New Brunswick is. It is up here next to Maine, uh, north of Nova Scotia, and west of PEI. I will not sugarcoat this. I'm about to cover a lot of ground very fast. Please buckle up. So what is FAIR? FAIR is a set of principles created by a diverse group of stakeholders involved in the Force 11 conference and meetings uh, across the scholarly research landscape. It's meant to address an urgent need to improve infrastructure supporting the reuse of scholarly data. And there is a specific emphasis on, emphasis on enhancing the ability of machines to automatically find and use the data. Uh, this happened because researchers generate a profound volume of data, and this volume of data can make it hard to discover materials or understand how you can use the things you find, connect to other pieces of scholarship or make connections obvious, assert or assign credit, and correlate that work with institutions, fund funders, institutes, this kind of stuff. Basically, there's so many products of research spread across varied and disparate piles and platforms that it's difficult to see relationships, find associated materials, and follow the narratives of research. And even if you can find something, you might not be at all sure whether or not you can reuse it. So they started working on FAIR. Now you're probably saying, I'm not a data scientist. I, you know, uh, how, how accessible my research data needs to be. This may be not super important, but uh, they're acknowledging that metadata, because it is data about data, uh, in any case where the principles should be applied to metadata and data, they just use the sort of bracketed phrase, metadata. So it's included. Um, FAIR is an acronym. It means findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse. Fair enough. Uh, and each section, we'll go into a little bit here, the overview and some of the basic tenets, and then we'll come back to this later in the context of persistent identifiers. So first of all, findability. Metadata and data should be easy to find for both humans and computers, ideally. Machine-readable metadata are essential for automatic discovery of data sets and services. And the tenants include metadata are assigned with a globally unique and persistent identifier, cough, cough. Metadata are described with rich metadata, or sorry, data are described with rich metadata. Metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data they describe. Metadata are registered and indexed in a searchable resource. You're probably seeing this already kind of maybe making some clear connections. Accessibility. Uh, once a user finds the required data, they need to know how they can be accessed possibly including authentication and authorization. Note accessibility in this case does not necessarily mean like, uh, you know, accessibility of uh, or, you know, accessibility tools, uh, readability, that kind of stuff. Uh, metadata are retrievable by their identifier using standardized communications protocols and metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. Interoperability, uh, data needs to be integrated with other data, typically. Data needs to interoperate with applications, workflows for analysis, storage, and processing. Uh, so in this case, uh, metadata use a formal, accessible, shared, and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. Metadata use vocabularies that follow fair principles. Metadata include qualified references to other metadata. And lastly, reusable. Metadata and data should be well described so that they can be replicated and or combined in different settings. Uh, metadata are richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. Metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license. Metadata are associated with detailed provenance and metadata meet domain relevant community standards. So what does this have to do with PIDs? And I thought it might be instructive to kind of go over very quickly how PIDs work in general, because I think it is a bit of a blind spot for something that is such a big deal for our work. So we'll use the DOI as an example. So DOIs obviously are ubiquitous. We see them all over the place in references, bibliographies on journal and article websites and repos on published data sets. And we probably know one very handy thing about them. If you click on a DOI that looks like a link, it will take you to the thing. 
DOIs are the most prominent persistent identifier, and they are also arguably the most important persistent identifier, at least in scholarly publishing. DOIs are made up of two chunks, and they mean different things. There's a prefix, that's the 10 dot digits. Uh, prefix is usually associated with a publisher or organization. DOIs for that organization will usually have the same prefix, but some places, if they're big enough, will have a handful. And then there's a suffix, which is meant to be a machine readable, not human readable, machine readable, opaque, unique string that is specific to the singular work which it is assigned. If I prepend a DOI with this first chunk, HTTPS, through colon, backslash, backslash, uh, doi.org, it turns into a URL. Clicking this will redirect me to the publication this DOI is associated with. And this process of redirecting you to a publication is called resolution. DOIs aren't just like a bit.ly link or tiny URL. If you're familiar with these services, they swap out really big unwieldy links. So you can share something that isn't super huge and is a little bit more compact and tidy, uh, not a big mess. So for example, in the top here, there's a bit.ly link for a talk I did on Open Scholarly Infrastructure, and then below is the actual URL for that talk. Bitly and TinyURL are both basic redirects. However, a DOI is a lot more than a redirect. Any single DOI is a reference to an entire publication record. That publication record is full of metadata, and one of these metadata elements is the publication's URL. When you resolve a DOI by clicking on it, the record is accessed, where it is stored, the stored URL is retrieved, you are sent to the stored URL. The URL can be updated by the publisher, and the DOI stays the same. This is XML related to a publication record. Um, if it is early in the morning for you, I'm sorry you have to look at this. But there's a lot of information here. This is just CrossRef XML, and it includes publisher, deposit, and date timestamps. This is a book chapter, so this is a book type. Contributors, and in which role, and whether or not they are first. Uh, title and subtitle publication date, the DOI for the book, a link to the book a chapter title, a DOI for the chapter, and a link for the chapter. This is just a small piece. So up close, you can see here at the top, we've got the DOI for the book, a timestamp for the book, and then the link, and then below the DOI for the chapter, a timestamp for the chapter, and then a link. So when you change the location of content, you update that DOI with the new location. Everyone who uses the DOI gets the content no matter where you put it, so long as that DOI is updated and the DOI is persistent. Unlike publications themselves, metadata in this space is typically free, and we can learn a lot from it. Crossref, for example, can store the following things, not inclusive, as publicly accessible metadata for any individual record. Title, subtitle, authors, orchids, affiliation, copyright license, funder and grant IDs, languages, ROAR values, references, resource locations, versions, publishers, the journal, the volume, the issue number, related DOIs to things like preprints or uh, data sets, dates, and abstracts. It's a lot of content that exists for every individual DOI that gets registered. Every DOI registered with Crossref or data site, the two most prominent for scholarly works is attached to a metadata record for that work. Both agencies maintain a public API that allows users to resolve DOIs, pull and view all registered metadata, push that metadata elsewhere, like for example, Orkin. This metadata is, as you might've guessed, hugely useful. Congratulations, you now know more about DOIs than a frankly surprising amount of people. And by extension, you mo know more about PIDs than a frankly surprising amount of people. But no PID is an island. Uh, folks use the phrase minting a DOI to describe the assignment of a DOI to work. I see this a lot. Journal editors will say, why? Minted all these DOIs, but they're not working. Uh, anybody can mint a DOI, but you need to register them with a third party for them to be useful. So that's done by PID registration agencies. Registration agencies uh, are the people who manage PIDs in general. Uh, and typically, they're international not-for-profits. Uh, they store records, metadata, they facilitate resolution requests, and may or may not offer other services based on membership. They do much of this through APIs. And I'll talk a little bit about APIs in a second. There are a lot of registration agencies. Each agency may differ in their mandate, governance, scope, service, supported objects, membership, terms, and feature set. All of this stuff is not the same. Not everybody describes it work identically across the field of all scholarly research, and it changes from provider to provider but they also often work together and share data. So quick review, we've got Crossref. Most scholarly publishers are Crossref members. Uh, they've got over 130 million records in the Crossref uh, uh, data set. Uh, Crossref are a big deal. <laughs> they're kind of the number one in this space. Uh, they're also a bunch of sweeties. Uh, data site, uh, some scholarly publishers use data site for article DOIs, uh, but it's much more commonly used in institutional or disciplinary repositories or data repositories. Data site and Crossref work together extensively to connect research data to publications. There's PIDs for researchers, so obviously ORCID, that's why we're here, and then others like Scopus and Web of Science, but people pay for those and those companies stink. Um, uh, so again, 
Uh, these services share data between each other using the aforementioned APIs. Then there's PIDs for organizations. Roar is really running away with things here. Um, and the predominant use case for organizational IDs is in strengthening the connections between the records and open scholarly infrastructure to make sure that you can tie works to institutions. Registration agencies provide a metadata schema through which users can describe the objects they're registering PIDs for. You would describe a person differently than a data set or a journal article or an organization. Uh, and even when agencies use the same type of PID, like the DOI, the schema they use may vary. So data, uh, data sites article schema is different than Crossref's article schema. So persistent identifiers, we know what they do. They make things easier to find, track, share, and access. Does that sound anything like fair to you? Um, if my articles have DOIs, I can provide persistent links to their most recent location, which will ensure ease of access and citation. If my ORCID ID is present as metadata in the DOIs of the work I publish, I can pull my publication record easily and add it to my ORCID profile. And if a funding agency can pull metadata from my ORCID profile, they can acquire all of my publication metadata without me having to fill out a pile of forms. This is what we call open scholarly infrastructure. And I'm using in the background a shot of uh, SimCity 2000, uh, ironically released in 1993, to represent infrastructure, the waterways. Uh, and I often use the phrase, PIDs are in the drinking water of scholarly publishing. This infrastructure is all connected and PIDs are flowing back and forth between sources this whole time. So this network of APIs that is involved in open scholarly infrastructure is like a municipal water system. Uh, and increasingly, it's relied upon by researchers and institutions whether or not they're really aware of it. If you use a CRIS, for example, uh, a lot of that metadata is being pulled from the Crossref API or the ORCID API automatically. You don't really even need to think about it too much. Almost all open scholarly infrastructure is based around APIs. So APIs. Uh, Quite possibly the most used and least understood acronym in modern librarianship, API stands for Application Programming Interface. Uh, and real quick, an API is basically a set of rules for interacting with software. Think of it a little like a translator working as an intermediary between two people who don't speak the same language. Real quick example, APIs are everywhere. When my calendar app tells me today's forecast, it's using information from the AccuWeather API. When my watch vibrates because I got a text message, that's because Garmin's API is communicating with Apple's notifications API. APIs are how these disparate systems built by different people using different languages, programming languages, and languages they speak, different definitions. It's how they find common ground and share information between each other, APIs. That's not an API. It's, again, it's, the, it's, it's this whole municipal water system of open scholarly infrastructure. So you might imagine a situation where you've got Roar and DataCite and Crossref, and then they're pulling and pushing content to and from publishers and data sites pulling, pushing and pulling content from GitHub and Dataverse and Zenodo. Uh, and then we've got Zotero and Mendeley using the Crossref API to pull in metadata into those records. And then we've got OpenAir sort of aggregating huge amounts of metadata from a bunch of these other places using APIs. We've got Google Scholar, we've got Chris Systems, we've got Funders, we've got Unpaywall and Share Your Paper, all places dipping into this networked system of APIs and open scholarly infrastructure. So in concert with this open scholarly infrastructure, PIDs allow us to see the big picture through the connections and interactions of the works being created by scholars. It can expose relationships between data and research or institutions and outcomes, and it can make research outcomes more discoverable. You can learn a little bit more about the narrative of a research project if you can follow all of the products of, say, a funding ID. When we talk about PIDs, we're talking about supporting open infrastructure and free exchange of metadata. Does this sound fair to you? It sounds fair to me. So let's go back. We've got findable. And here on the right, I put a little check mark. Metadata are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. Oh, shit. Uh, metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data they describe. Check. Registered and indexed in a searchable resource. Check. Uh, accessibility, retrievable by their identifier using standard communications protocols. Uh huh. Um, are accessible even when the data no longer are. Yes, the metadata records don't get deleted just because uh, uh, an article is taken down and wouldn't include actually uh, stuff like uh, teardown notices or retraction information. Uh, sort of metadata uses a formal accessible, shared and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation in a lot of ways in articles at least, it's JATS, um, but you know we kind of come and go from varying standards. Vocabularies allow to follow fair principles, stuff like the core language and repositories or other controlled vocabulary around these things. Metadata include qualified references to other metadata. So every Crossref deposit includes references, for example, and it can include your DOIs for the other places that work lives. 
And lastly, reusable metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license that is in Crossref for sure. And data meet domain relevant community standards uh, really depends on which PID you're using. So we embrace FAIR in general, just by using and supporting PIDs that kind of go hand in hand in this way. I should have reused the chocolate and peanut butter slide. These two things are kind of the same. FAIR is not so secretly all about open scholarly infrastructure and the connections between these things. But there is an elephant in the room here, which is metadata. The metadata we get out of these systems and its utility is very much dependent on its quality. We have a general expression in the metadata universe that's garbage in, garbage out. If I publish a journal article in a journal and then the sort of Rube Goldberg machine of places that metadata ends up because of open scholarly infrastructure gets going, then that bad metadata is in a bajillion different places and no longer really in my control. So it's important that people understand the importance of metadata right from the point of publication or sharing or posting whatever piece of work that we're sharing. It can be changed, but it, it, does, it does take time. Metadata is kind of everyone's responsibility. I often say it happens to researchers and less for them, um, but researchers, librarians, publishers, registration agencies, everyone has a stake in accurate, usable metadata. Metadata is a very complicated topic. And I could talk about it for twice the length of this talk and imagine how much I could say in that amount of time. Anytime I will do it, please let me know. Anyway, I'm very sorry about how fast this all was. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Lots of great information there. Looks very thought provoking as we're seeing a lot of discussion in the chat, which is wonderful. Um, so next up, um, Riley, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen and we will um, love to hear what you have to say about the care principles. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. That was Truly amazing. <laughs> I just learned so much. Um, Buenas and half a day, Todas Hanzu. My name is Riley Taiting Pong, and I'm really excited to be here today to give you really an introduction to the care principles and hopefully open up some connections to thinking about PIDs. Um, and though I'll be looking forward very much to the contributions you all have in that in that vein. Um, as Sheila said, I am a postdoc at the Native Nations Institute, the University of Arizona. Um, though I'm calling in today from San Diego, where I live and work on the unceded uh, territories of the Kumeyaay Nation. I want to acknowledge that a lot of the work I'm sharing with you today comes from contributions from my PI, Stephanie Carroll, and other colleagues of mine with the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, GIDA, as well as the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance, um, and our URL is listed there at the bottom of the page. So um, to launch into it, I'm going to spend some time defining some terms for you all uh, kind of at the outset of this presentation. Then I'll spend the bulk of it giving you kind of a crash course into the care principles. And then I'll close by pointing to a few projects that may be of interest or use to this community. All righty. Oh, and I should also mention um, I'm Chamorro. I'm indigenous to the Marianas Islands in, um, the, in Micronesia, specifically the island of Guahan or Guam. Okay, so to uh, first start out by defining some terms. So who are indigenous people? Uh, according to the UN, some 476 million people around the world identify as indigenous. And though indigenous peoples represent just 6% of the overall global population, their lands comprise some one fourth of Earth's surface and their lands encompass some 80% of Earth's remaining biodiversity. And so if you're thinking about the tremendous value that exists both in these natural resources and in the knowledge systems of people who have long tended to them, there's of course great value in the data derived from both. And so this brings us to indigenous data. What are indigenous data? Indigenous data are data information and knowledges in any format that impact indigenous peoples, nations, and communities, both at individual and collective levels. So data, indigenous data include information about our non-human relations, so land, water, uh, air, soil, sacred ecosystems, plants, animals, and so on. Uh, also includes information about indigenous peoples as individuals. This can be census data, um, administrative, legal, health, social, among others, and also about uh, indigenous peoples as collectives. So this includes traditional and cultural information, language, knowledge systems, ancestral and clan knowledges, and so on. I also want to point out that indigenous peoples have always been data experts. 
And so indigenous knowledge systems are developed and refined over generations through observation. And many cultures use a variety of different oral and physical mechanisms for transmitting uh, that knowledge and information. And so a couple of examples on this slide from North America of tools for storing and conveying information, starting from the left clockwise are a totem pole, the Lakota winter count, an autumn calendar stick and a wampum belt. And I have here in my house, Another example, um, if you can see this, this is a Marshallese stick chart. So um, from my neck of the woods in Oceania, this is something that voyagers would use to uh, track information about um, wave patterns, atolls with the shells. And this is something they would use to commit to memory to guide their navigation on their uh, voyaging ships. And so um, <clears throat> as you're, many of you are probably aware, uh, due to different kinds of colonial projects aimed at extinguishing or suppressing or co-opting indigenous knowledge, indigenous data have been um, affected by these. And this brings us to the importance of indigenous data sovereignty. So indigenous peoples everywhere in response to those histories and ongoing realities are engaged in different projects to revitalize, restore, and protect their knowledge systems. And this is why Indigenous data sovereignty or IDSOV is such an important part of those efforts to restore and revitalize their knowledge systems for generations to come. And so IDSOV is founded on the inherent sovereignty of Indigenous peoples and refers to the rights of Indigenous peoples to govern their data from collection and storage to use and reuse. IDSOV leverages laws, uh, policies, agreements, including the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Ind Indigenous Peoples or UNDRIP and other nation state recognition of indigenous peoples, treaties, and other mechanisms. And IDSOV is really about supporting the roles and responsibilities that communities have for the care and use of their knowledge, uh, and then embedding and instilling those roles and responsibilities within data ecosystems across the whole data life cycle. I also wanna point out that only indigenous peoples and nations can exercise indigenous data sovereignty as rights holders, but other entities can practice indigenous data governance to support and uphold those sovereign rights. I also wanna point out that there's an interdependent Peoples also need mechanisms to honor, protect, and control their information, both internally and externally. This is what we call governance of data. And there are many indigenous data uh, governance principles for indigenous data at different levels. And so, for example, we have the broad principles such as CARE, which span international contexts, uh, which I'll get more into today. We also have regional principles. So this includes things like the principles of Maori data sovereignty out of Aotearoa, New Zealand, or OCAP out of a First Nations context. And then there are also different kinds of principles and frameworks for data at the level of individual indigenous nations. <clears throat> and so indigenous people's data principles have developed alongside more mainstream data principles. And what would eventually become the CARE principles began with a coalition of indigenous scholars, many of whom are listed on this slide, um, and an exercise that they did to kind of assess and compare the values between mainstream indigenous data principles um, and uh, indigenous data principles. And to frame sort of a key takeaway from this effort uh, is that the mainstream conversation around data has been more data centric, while indigenous peoples and communities data principles have been more people and purpose oriented. And so this is from where the point from which the care principles were developed. And so care includes four principles and three sub principles under each. They are as follows. So C is for collective benefit. And this details that data ecosystems should be designed and function in ways that enable indigenous peoples as collectives to benefit from data. A is for authority to control, which emphasizes the need for those working with data to uphold indigenous people's rights to and support their interests in data. R is for responsibility, which reminds us that those working with indigenous data must center indigenous people's self-determination and collective benefit in data relationships. And E is for ethics, which focuses on using indigenous people's ethics to guide decisions on harm, benefits, justice, and future use. Um, it should be noted that care is really a high level 
um, principle or framework and it needs customizing or tailoring with specific groups and communities. So one size, of course, does not fit all. And the care principles really shift the focus of data, data governance from consultation to value-based relationships. And they've been widely recognized as enriching the discussion of collective rights to data for other populations as well. I also want to point out that um, care and fair are complementary principles. So while fair seeks to increase data sharing, um, an open science paradigm, again, care principles bring that people and purpose orientation to uh, data governance. And so implementation of care and fair together should be seen as necessary to allow indigenous peoples to govern access and use their data and to share data on their own terms. And I always love the adage, as open as possible, as closed as necessary to capture the balance of the responsibilities um, under these interconnected principles. Okay, now I'm gonna point you to a handful of resources that I think would be useful that come out of some of our Alliance or GIDA. And so this really defines and delineates Indigenous people's rights in data. And so this is kind of part of this shift in the conversation from the language of stakeholders to rights holders. And so you can check out this paper at GIDA's website or at um, Frontiers, the associated publication in Frontiers. Okay. And then I'll um, end by mentioning a couple of projects that I'm co-leading through my postdoc with the Native Nations Institute. And so first is a phased framework for care implementation that we're developing. And so there's kind of, as the care principles have become um, more popular, more widely cited and of interest to all kinds of different data actors in different settings, there's been a lot of interest, especially from folks in data repositories in tools to really guide concrete application and implementation of care to put it into practice. And so one thing that we're developing is a phased framework for implementation. Uh, we've outlined so far a series of six phases, and we're working with partners across the main environmental DNA project, ASU's Natural History Collections and Library, uh, NYU, Local Context and Rich, um, and University of Waikato, and also Lychee, which is the local indicators for climate change impacts based out of Europe. And so working with these folks, we're collecting examples of their practices on the ground to uh, implement Indigenous data governance and the care principles and outlining a series of phases of what this work looks like. And right now we're really focused on what we're calling phase zero to emphasize that there's some kind of requisite pre-work that needs to happen to prepare any data holding institution or setting to enter into this work. And so um, I can say more about this in the discussion, but this is really covering a lot of what is the kind of early learning that needs to happen what is the kind of reckoning that needs to happen with the coloniality of one's own institution or setting, also auditing your data to understand what indigenous data you might hold, and then really assessing and aligning your policies, your cyber infrastructure to support implementation of care principles. Okay, secondly, I want to mention a couple of self-assessment tools that we're developing right now. One is the care uh, self-assessment that we've adapted from the folks at Lychee that I mentioned. This is available online. I'm happy to share uh, the URL in the chat after this talk. And this is sort of a pilot tool and we're really interested in feedback on it to, for people who are interested in kind of entering into indigenous data governance work to assess what kind of data they have and what alignments there are between their settings and their policies and practices to the care principles. Additionally, we're developing the CARE data maturity model. This is based off of the FAIR data maturity model and FAIR um, and CARE criteria, it's also called. And so this is really operationalizing um, through an operationalizing CARE through an assessment tool. And so eventually this tool will be something that can be used to assess CARE implementation in one setting. And we're developing so far um, a draft of about 30 indicators that operationalize uh, the principle through a sort of measurable goal. So for example, we have the sub-principle or criteria for care about recognizing indigenous people's rights and interests to their knowledge and data under A, authority to control, and an indicator to measure the sort of oper operationalization of this is, for example, the presence of data sharing agreements uh, that explicitly recognize IDSAW, for example, on a public facing site or within data management plans. 
Um, I won't read all of this, but this just gives you kind of a sense of the scope of things that are captured in the more than 30 indicators that we've drafted across CAR and E for care. And I'll just point out that I think that there's some opportunities and alignments for thinking about PID um, and thinking about indigenous metadata that I think could connect to some of the things we're thinking about here today. And finally, I want to highlight a, a recent communique that we published, which is the Indigenous Metadata Bundle. And so we held a symposium back in May on Lenape Hoking in New York and virtually to identify key categories <clears throat> recommended for the development of an um, indig Indigenous Metadata Block or what we're calling a bundle. And so we have an advanced copy of this online that you can check out. I'll also drop that in the chat. And I think that, again, there's some great alignments here for thinking about uh, Indigenous metadata, PIDs, and FAIR, and CARE. Okay, and so I'll go ahead and stop there for now and say a big uh, sinamase or thank you to ORCID, to Sheila, and to all of my collaborators who've been part of this work. Look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Riley. Um, okay, so I'm going to make it so that people can unmute themselves. You can also choose to turn your video on if you want to. By no means do you have to. Um, you can also continue to put things into the chat. Um, I did see a question come in um, recently about care. And it is, does CARE apply to all research output or only research data? Feels like it should be the former. And then that kind of leads to a question about what is research data? Um, Riley, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that um, or we can open it up to the group too. Sure, yeah, I can respond and love for other people to weigh in as well. Um, I think, CARE is meant to really broadly apply to Indigenous peoples' rights in data. This definitely includes research, including research conducted by universities. Um, Gita recently put out a communique, I can also share the link to that, really targeting Indigenous peoples' rights um, and interests in research in universities, but that's just one, one specific context. So we also work with people across all kinds of other uh, entities, data-holding entities. This is federal and state agencies. This is um, data repositories, environmental databases, among others, some of whom are conducting research and, and many of whom are not. So I think just thinking um, broadly about what our indigenous data can kind of answer the question of to, to whom and to what does care apply. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it over to John to help us moderate the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there have been some questions asked throughout and many discussions that have gone on. Um, so maybe what I'll ask people to do is to just post, uh, if there's sort of a question they'd like to be part of the discussion, just post it again as a novel question here and we'll start uh, reading them out. Um, I'm seeing lots of links at the moment. There were some interesting questions about, uh, if I scroll back a bit, regarding tombstone pages for DOIs. Um, where can I find that? Apologies. Yeah, I believe that was more about if an item doesn't have a DOI, are there best practices around um, ensuring that the item metadata still is available, uh, even if the item itself is no longer available, I believe. But feel free to chime in. Um, I believe um, whoever was um, talking about that. Et encore, si vous avez des questions en français, n'hésitez pas à les poser en français. If you have French questions, please don't hesitate to ask them in French. I have kind of a, a thought that has been on my mind for a while um, that kind of relates to both fair and care, um, which is, you know, fair is all about 
you know, Mike, you talked a lot about open uh, research, open scholarship, making everything findable, putting it out there, having other people reuse it, um, and just having everything be open. But I know that when it comes to some indigenous data, indigenous knowledge, um, it's not necessarily meant for everyone to be able to access and and reuse it. Um, so, you know, thinking about where persistent identifiers come into play. Um, and I think I'm seeing a question in the chat that's related to this. How do you see PIDs being used in the implementation of the care principles? So thinking about kind of the intersection of all these things, if we have, let's say, let's say, for example, we have like a data set that, you know, is a or like a collection of information that was gathered from an indigenous community that um, really culturally is not, does not need to be open, should not be open to everyone, but like we assign a DOI to it, for example. Um, you know, just because it has that DOI and we kind of think of like, oh yeah, assign DOIs to things that you want to be findable and reusable and stuff like that. But, you know, this item might have a DOI, but we actually don't want it to be reused or even accessed by everyone. So I don't know, just kind of putting that thought out there, I would love to hear, you know, anyone else's kind of thoughts around these types of intersections. And that's all I'll say. I'll be quiet now. Um, I guess I'd just add so that this is one of the weird hiccups with FAIR, right? Like there's an assumption of access, but the way that they phrase it is like, like, you know where to get it if you can, or there's authentication for it. But there's not a presumption in FAIR that the work will be open access, that the work will be actually accessible to people. A lot of the stuff that's happening in FAIR is about tracking research that's with major publishers, right? So, you know, a lot of that work is is paywall. Um, it's more about being able to get to the record and to know whether or not that work is a work that you want to use by having access to the metadata. That's really important for FAIR specifically. I just want everything to be open uh, because uh, I hate publishers. But, but <laughs> you know, in general, I think that that's important. And we have that issue. That issue is a big one, right? Like, I have this really interesting question with some people in, um, some people who are in Finland and they had an author who wanted their name taken off of everything they'd ever published. And based on GDPR, that that's like a completely reasonable request. It's like a right to be forgotten law. Like they've like this, I don't want my work assigned to any of this stuff. And they were like, well, I mean, it's, it's in the wind, we can take it off the record, but it's in citations and it's in all these other places. And I think, um, you know, there's obviously work that doesn't, doesn't need to be before everyone. Um, and I think, you know, we, we kind of let the genie out of the bottle on this one. Uh, <laughs> kids, kids contribute to that, that, that metadata is, is everywhere. I can also respond to this and I'd, I'd love to hear others weigh in. Um, but a lot of what we're thinking about in our work around indigenous metadata and also kind of operationalizing through the indicators, like starting points and ways to embed care and infrastructure is what are the ways that we can communicate indigenous attributions, indigenous rights, indigenous cultural authority and interests in connection to data. And um, I've been learning a lot from folks with the local context organization. Um, if not sure if folks are familiar with them, but a lot of the work that they've done in developing different kinds of digital labels and notices to sit alongside indigenous data to, for example, communicate uh, that some institution holds indigenous data, right, to make different kinds of public disclosures about data to enhance the findability of those data by their associated indigenous communities, or then with some of their label tools, working with indigenous communities to identify what are the rights and interests that sit in relationship to that digital record, and how can those relationships be embedded into the stewardship of it online. And so, for example, they have certain data within museums collections uh, that use the labels to say this is um, this artifact or record has certain seasonal stewardship practices. Um, so it shouldn't be sort of viewed until this time of year. 
And then that information is communicated and then embedded uh, in the cyber infrastructure to ensure that the digital record is respecting the way that those uh, data and relations are cared for um, in real life offline. So I'd love to hear others weigh in um, on what kinds of opportunities there are with PID to uh, strengthen and enable the communication again of indigenous attributions, rights and interests in connection to data. So if you have any responses to that, please do feel free to raise your hand, speak up, add it in the chat. Um, and well, oh, please go ahead. Sorry, um, I'm not, okay, I haven't looked this up. I didn't have to take a quick look in Roar. I was just curious, like, uh, if any um, Indigenous nations uh, would be like considered institutions in Roar or like have their own, um, like an authorship or an ORCID uh, for, so that, uh, you know, you could find, you more easily find the collected works of uh, indigenous nations um, uh, is like in the scholarship. Like, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, I get what you're saying, Tess, like maybe just, um metadata fields within identifiers like Roar and um, ORCID and DOIs that could indicate something similar to like the traditional knowledge lab labels and things that local contexts are coming up with. Um, I, I would love to hear if anybody on this call has knowledge about any metadata fields within any of these identifiers specifically for that purpose? I know that DOIs have rights, you know, can contain rights information. What was the specific field again? Sorry, I was writing about credit. Just any any kind of, you know, metadata field within a any kind of PID, ROAR, DOIs, ORCID, or anything else that could indicate, you know, whether, you know, a person is um, coming from a specific Indigenous community or a, an right. object that a DOI has been assigned to is contains um, traditional knowledge or something like that. I could see it, I could see this being an opportunity for um, like the local context labels that Riley was talking about to be kind of embedded in PID metadata, although I don't know if that's happening. Um, but I see Kelly added about uh, oh. about it in data site um, uh, support for local context and notices in in the data site schema. I would presume that there's a there's a, a way in which it is typically handled in Crossref, but it's not something that would be I think. Like it's it's so specifically like article publication metadata um, that it may not be in there. It does raise an interesting question though about like like multilingualism in metadata and the sort of like shared uh, namespaces for things. Like we had at PKP, we had a long conversation about indigenous place names and how indigenous pl place names are tied typically to um, uh, like ISO standards for country labels, which don't include indigenous place names. <laughs> and so if somebody wanted to include an indigenous place name as their location for where they were working, the metadata would choke downstream because it, it would say like, well, this isn't one of the recognized fields that we're expecting for a nation in shorthand and control vocabulary. And so uh, in some cases, there's issues where we want to or are inclined to record metadata that we believe to be valuable that is not accepted anywhere downstream in a way that is usable at the moment. So it's almost like you have to figure out, it's like a chicken or the egg situation where like an organization like Crossref or Data Site or someone else uh, would have to say, okay, well, we're going to specifically accommodate this specific kind of metadata and this is what it would look like. And then all the people who push metadata that way are expected to do it a certain way. That's what interaction of like APIs and pushing metadata between JATS and Crossref and ORCID and all this other stuff. Sometimes the translations aren't one-to-one, -one, so you lose out on these pieces. And and multilingual metadata is just especially a problem because, you know, if I'm Spanish and I'm writing all of my metadata in Spanish, but then also in English, and then the places downstream can't take both, then I'm wasting a bunch of my time. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's especially bad. 
I'm just going to jump in. There are not, there are many, many questions that have popped up in the chat. So I'm just going to start going through those. But this is a really uh, fascinating discussion. And if folks want to add more on these topics, please do feel free to do so. Uh, this question is from Sarah, and it's something I've currently come across in discussions among Indigenous research administrators in Canadian universities, is how care principles apply to individual Indigenous data that may be considered incidental. Uh, are there any wise practices on how to respect care principles in these types of examples? Um, I'm not sure here what's meant by incidental, so uh, please do feel free to add that in the chat, but otherwise I want to throw it to our speakers. I can also explain. Um, so for example, when um, a research team might be doing work on homelessness, but they're not specifically targeting working with an Indigenous community or Indigenous organization, but we all know that Indigenous data will appear. Um, and so figuring out how care principles apply to those situations is, it, it's becoming more and more common. So I'd be very interested in hearing if folks have any advice. Yeah, I remember, you know, reading about the care principles and that, you know, they were developed, as you had already said, Riley, for specifically for thinking about Indigenous communities, but could be applied to any any community, like um, the homeless population, for example, um, like you're saying. So I think if we can just keep those care points in mind when working with any kind of group, um, I, that would be helpful. Just in keeping that in consideration. All right, well, I'll let folks uh, sit with that and maybe move on to the next question here from a different Sarah, which is, has the increasing presence of generative AI changed discussions around machine readability of metadata and research outputs? And if so, how? Oh, what a fun question that makes me want to vomit a little i so the metadata is already accessible right like i think the the hardest part about metadata is that it's not always in one place like uh we talk about um institutional repository problems and how all the work that's generated in these repositories all live in disparate boxes all over the place so i can't just go like hey i want to look at all of last year's open access canadian research on x like i, I because i have to look in a million different places to do it but language models crawl huge swaths of, of uh, 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 content online to make those things happen. So, I mean, they're already crawling and they're crawling all the time and they have the luxury of time. Like you can just go index a bunch of web, you don't have to return a response immediately, right? Well, not yet, anyway. Um, so I think uh, it's an interesting question, I, but, but the metadata is almost always free. Uh, even major publishers, like it's very rare that someone says you have to pay for access to metadata. And so you can crawl all that stuff the same way whether or not it's it's open, it's just that you're calling a lot more stuff. And in a way that is not searchable, like a search engine isn't doing the same thing as when you're crawling all of that stuff and creating a corpus. Um, so, I mean, I'm no AI expert uh, and I'm doing my best to answer this question in a way that makes any sort of sense. But to me, uh, I don't think this is a big issue. I think that AI handles the way it absorbs that content and those large models handle the, the way that they absorb that content very differently than we do with say open air where we push records to open air and then it takes those DOIs and it scrapes, you know, known repositories or other places pushed to open air. And it starts to match that metadata, right? It goes like, oh, well, this uh, this title and these authors are on 10 records. And then they kind of merge the records together and show you DOIs for where all the places came from. That's, that's a little bit different than just sort of like crawling the entire internet and then generating a short story about something with fake citations. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, I think uh, this may be our last question. We'll see, uh, depending on the discussion it generates. But I think this is sort of a, a great place potentially to end, as I think it's really at the core of this session, which is uh, learning more about boundary cases where requests between fair and care principles might conflict. Any any thoughts on sort of addressing those boundary cases? What might a boundary case look like and, and how might one go about uh, working that through? Uh, 
Riley, you want to take a first shot here? Yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble coming up with a specific boundary case, but I guess just I just would really emphasize again that, and I think others and and you, Mike, have made this point clear too, that sometimes there's this conception of, of fair really always um, signifying open, open, open up everything, right? But again, that adage, as open as possible, as closed as necessary, I think captures that um, those kinds of responsibilities can can be held together. And so somebody said in the chat, pretty sure err on the side of care. And I'd also like to kind of connect this to Wanda's uh, question about not appropriating care, because I think this is really important. Um, the authors of the care principles recognize that absolutely they have import for other communities and they're getting taken up in all kinds of other contexts in, in amazing ways. But I think the important thing to remember so as not to appropriate is one, that care comes is derived in response and responsibility to indigenous people's rights in data. And so remembering that that is a very specific set of um, responsibilities, right? And so this can be applied within other settings as well, again, ideally in relationship with those communities to really operationalize what are their own responsibilities to an interest in data. Um, and I think, you know, the more the more locally you can work with communities to develop that kind of guidance and practice, uh, the better. Yeah, I, I think I think that's true. And I also think that on the fair side, the issues are, I think, predominantly with interoperability. And I mentioned this in the chat about like credit nomenclature for uh, types of attributions. Like like in some indigenous works, you might have an attribution like storyteller or like an oral history or or something that is that is specific to that community. And it's not in credit, right? So everybody's like, let's jam stuff in credit. And it's like author, editor, <laughs> translator. So we're trying to lean towards controlled vocabulary to better describe the works that are happening. And we're leaving out these uh, descriptions and frameworks for describing the works of people um, because it doesn't make sense in an academic framework that we've been working on for forever. I wrote I wrote in the response to what Riley said, like, because our publishing industry is so Eurocentric and they're not particularly interested in solving these problems in a broad way, um, then we end up with stuff getting left kind of on the cutting room floor. So this question of data using vocabularies that follow fair principles. Well, we certainly use vocabulary, um, but probably a lot of the vocabularies are chosen in order to make that uh, acceptable by fair, but the vocabulary itself probably wasn't generated using fair principles. That makes sense. We find the vocabularies that kind of exist. Um, and this idea of a broadly ap applicable language for knowledge representation, again, we run up against those things. The, the way that we describe representation of knowledge across traditional sort of Eurocentric publishing and in indigenous ways of learning and sharing works, but they're different. So I, I think you know, fair can put you in a situation where you're kind of trying to jam a square peg through a round hole, right? Like you're 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 trying to describe a thing in a way um, that the metadata won't let you, um, and you're like, well, this is the most open metadata scheme I have, and it has to push to all of these places, and you still can't do it the way you want, uh, and then you end up with metadata that doesn't go where it's supposed to go. So, um, I think because a lot of it's based on standards, you end up in these situations where they kind of pass each other. Wow, this is a lot to think about. And I think there are still a lot of questions and thoughts that we haven't gotten to. So um, so I think we're going to maybe go back and think about uh, scheduling another subsequent call where we can come back and pick up this discussion or somehow be able to continue the discussion. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I realize we are slightly over time, um, but thank you, everyone, for joining us today and bringing your energy here. Um, Riley, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you both being here. Um, and thank you for your time and your, um, your insight and expertise. Um, like I said earlier, we will be sending out the recording and the slides. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, feel free to get in touch with us. We've got email addresses in the chat. Um, but otherwise, thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye.